Our first speaker tonight is Stephen Reed from Block Tech. He's the CEO. And he's going to be talking about um, how peer to peer technologies and blockchains can help artists. Thanks, Paige. Mm -hmm. Everyone hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Um, I kind of had to come up with that title on a moment's notice. In, in reality, my talk is kind of more about how um, distributed applications in general can really enable everyone, uh, which is a big deal for me. Um, the first time I heard the, the, the term distributed applications, I was on a Skype call with some uh, meetup, or meetup organizers for Ethereum. And they were talking about how they wanted third-party developers to create these things, these, these smart contracts. Vitalik always in, insisted they were called smart contracts, and that's what they were, of course, technically. But what we started talking about was that they were a lot more than that. You know, when it, when it comes to how the user actually interacts with it, in reality, they were apps. You know, the, the, the blockchain was their operating system, and they weren't normal apps. You know, they were, they were running on this consensus mechanism. Um, they were distributed apps. We all love this term instantly. Um, we realized that, of course, we had and, and, and loved a number of distributed apps already, with BitTorrent clients and, and, and Bitcoin itself is a distributed app. Um, and we started seeing people start using this term very often within the, the kind of Bitcoin community, developing their own apps and stuff like that. But what we noticed was that many of the apps that were being developed were just as kind of single purpose as BitTorrent, uh, BitTorrent or Bitcoin. Um, and often within the, the kind of blockchain industry, they were very much still uh, doing payments, um, uh, remittance, and uh, all the kind of low-hanging fruit of the kind of financial industry that obviously Bitcoin makes sense for. Um, and these are enormous in their own right, but we felt like the true impact of the blockchain could be actually quite a bit larger. Um, it could be the operating system back end for distributed apps that didn't have just one core function. Apps that could work the way that normal consumer apps like iTunes or kind of any other kind of an app that you're used to using can work, but without the central points of failure that we're used to within these apps, without having to rely entirely on the servers of the company that makes this particular app. By combining various P2P technologies, you could take all these central points of failure out of it and deliver just the same experience, same quality experience that people are used to. Um, and do so in an entirely peer-to-peer -peer manner, entirely open source manner. This is really fantastic for us. We could do more than just distributed banking uh, and derivatives of it. We could actually do commerce over the internet. We could change how commerce happens and how uh, media distribution happens, not just by making the payment process more efficient, but by automating as much as possible, by taking advantage of this concept of machines being able to pay machines to change everything about it. Uh, to enable the audience to be involved in the distribution process. Um, to take the expensive middlemen out of the process entirely and make the artists make more money, make uh, the audience spend a little bit less and have a lot more freedom over how they're choosing to use the app. So we set out to build Alexandria to do exactly that. Um, but before I get into kind of how it works technically, I wanted to talk a little bit about my own somewhat circuitous path that I took to discovering the blockchain because I think it illuminates kind of the philosophy behind the app um, and why we feel that it kind of is an example of a new type of software that we think is really going to have a significant impact in the world. <coughs> so first a little background. A few years ago I was working in the visual effects industry. I was on a, uh, an independent film uh, with like a post-apocalyptic New York City skyline thing where the producers wanted a uh, uh, skyscraper off in the distance to explode and collapse as our heroes kind of watch through a mirror, or through a window rather. So I comp out the window and built a little city of New York and then I set to work to figure out how to blow up a building. And I am having some trouble with it looking realistic, like how the building falls and everything, and so I turn to YouTube and think, where can I find an example of a building collapsing, of a skyscraper collapsing, and I search for 9-11 building collapse. And I discover the other side of YouTube. I was unaware of this before this point. The, the tin hat wearers and the conspiracy theorists <laughs> had video after video after video that poked holes in the, in the official story and kind of suggested their own theories, whether it be complete government complicity in this whole thing or just the FBI trying to kind of obscure evidence to hide that they really screwed up big time. Um, 
And for me, this was a really big deal because 9-11 was more than just something I watched on TV. It was something that impacted almost a decade of my life. Um, nine months before 9-11, I was signing up to join the Marine Corps Reserve uh, as an infantryman because I thought, hey, if I'm going to get my college paid for and only have to go one weekend a month and two weeks a year, I might as well blow stuff up on the weekends. That'll be fun. Well, 9-11 happened, and that changed pretty dramatically. We got activated. Uh, we had a West Coast QRF mission to make sure that no further terrorist events happened. And then very quickly, they decided that our unit was going to go ahead and be on the front lines of the invasion of Iraq. And I got to witness, kind of, with this first-hand view, the awesome power of an empire just destroying a foreign country. Uh, and then I went to Africa, where my job was to kind of watch the back door into Al-Qaeda and make sure that the impoverished people of the Horn of Africa weren't being recruited into Al-Qaeda. And so, pretty obviously, the events of 9-11 had a really dramatic impact on my life, and so it really mattered to me. And just, just discovering that there were people questioning this really blew my mind, just opened it up and made me think, so wait, the media and the government might not be telling me the truth about everything? This is ridiculous. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so, at that point, I just felt like I needed to learn more about the world. And so I started getting into Commerce or uh, economic blogs and, and uh, international magazines and, and geopolitical blogs and learning as much as I could. But the more that I learned, the more kind of proud I was of my kind of knowledge of the world and my worldliness and whatnot, but I was also getting very depressed. There was a lot of really depressing stuff going on that I was learning about. I, I joined the anti-war movement, I protested in the streets, I went with a bunch of vets to DC to meet with congressmen and senators and the White House and the State Department to try to convince them that we're going about this all wrong. And I'm just, and of course, you know, they, they nod their heads and they say, oh, vets are great, we love you guys, and then, you know, they go with where the money is and they, they vote to, to send more troops into Afghanistan. And I'm just kind of like having all these illusions about the world shattered. And I'm learning that our food supply is basically owned by, say, a half a dozen or so chemical companies. Our, our media is entirely controlled by about a half a dozen enormous conglomerates. Um, as of, like, right now, I think, 20 minutes ago, there was a few thousand troops that are moving into uh, uh, Baltimore right now because of riots over this sense that there's just way too much police violence in our country and that there's far too many Americans that are still very much living in economic depression. Uh, as of this morning, there's reports that, an Iranian, or that Iranians boarded a freighter that we have to protect. So there's all these terrible things that are going on. There's all these cliffs that we're kind of driving toward. We're, we're, we're fighting foreign wars all over the world. Some people think we're fighting proxy wars against the bear itself in, 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 in Ukraine, Syria, now in, in Yemen. And so how can I possibly kind of look at the world and not just be ultimately depressed? I discovered Bitcoin and I thought this thing is really cool. You know, it's really spiffy. <laughs> and the more I learned about it, I'm like, this is just amazingly brilliant. But I was kind of feeling like this is Martha Stewart polishing the brass in the Titanic. It's all going down. You know, like who cares if we've got magic internet money if we're going to get into a nuclear war with Russia? Or if terrorists are going to backpack bomb all of our cities or, you know, any of these things. And at that point, I kind of discovered this, this uh, cyclical generational pattern that these guys named Strauss and Howe discovered. They kind of changed everything for me. They, they figured out that there's these long patterns, at least in American history, and they started figuring out that these patterns also exist in most of Europe, of about 80 years between really major events. 80 years ago was World War II, 80 years before that was the Civil War, 80 years before that was the Revolutionary War, and it keeps on going. And then that breaks down into these kind of sub-patterns of 20 years, where really dramatic kind of things can change in society. And they're trying to figure out why this is happening. And their theory is that the natural human lifespan is about 80 years. It's divided into four different sections of life. From birth until 20 years old or so, we're entirely dependent on our parents. We don't have a very strong uh, voice in the world. 20 to 40, we're kind of growing in our influence in the world. We're reducing our dependence on other people. 40 to 60, we really should be the most powerful. We, we kind of are going to be in the world. We're the leaders of industry and, and, and business and government, et cetera. And then 60 to 80 or longer, if we're lucky, we're in the waning years. We're losing our influence in the world. And what they noticed was that during periods when these four generational groups were shifting their places in society, say, for example, as the uh, uh, baby boomers are retiring out and Gen Xers are starting to take over business and the Millennials are starting to actually have a voice and go out in the streets and protest, 
really dramatic shifts in the direction that the entire world is going can happen just very suddenly. And a great example of this is in the turn of the 19th, 20th century, there was a serious problem with manure in New York City. All of commerce and, and, and uh, transportation was driven by horses and manure was just piling up everywhere. And no one could figure out what to do about it. They, they, they had a, 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 a big meeting in Paris to try to figure out what are you gonna do with the manure building up in all these major cities around the world. And no one could figure out a solution to this. And then eventually they discovered the car. Now I say discovered because it was invented probably 20 years before it started getting any traction. But in one of these generational shifts, as an old generation who maybe had some investment in the manure industry, I don't know, or in the, the horse feeding industry, I don't know, who had pushed back against the horseless carriage previously, stepped out, and new people that were like, ooh, technology, this is great, are starting to be in charge. They said, let's use the car, and it takes off rampantly, and suddenly there's no more problem with this thing that once people thought we were gonna have 30 feet of manure in the streets of New York City. And it was completely unavoidable. <clears throat> so that's where we find ourselves right now. You know, According to the kind of worldview I'm starting to form, we're very much driving off a cliff. We have all this momentum, we're going toward this cliff, and there's no signs that we're going to be changing direction anytime soon. How could this possibly uh, be averted? How could we not run into nuclear war with Russia? How could we not have complete economic collapse, etc.? But the reality is that because it's happening, because, and especially because there's so much more information awareness that so many more people know that these things are happening, are working feverishly on finding the solutions to these problems, and this unique opportunity that happens during these generational shifts Big changes take place. We make our dramatic left turn at the last second, and we save the world. In this case, <clears throat> when I learned about the theory, it kind of changed my worldview about the entire world, and I felt like we're saved. This is all fine. I didn't know why yet, um, but I realized that I already knew one of the tools that was going to do it, Bitcoin, or at least the technology behind it, blockchain. It, but it was more, historically, these have always been more than just a simple technological change. They've usually been kind of philosophical changes as well. In the Revolutionary War is the idea that a government should and could make at its very core purpose protecting the liberties of its people. The Civil War, some people would argue, is about states' rights, but overall the thing that came out of it was the idea that, uh, that not just white people have the right to be free. Um, some people could say that World War II, the, the, the philosophical thought that kind of went through was that uh, the common everyday man could actually fight off and destroy uh, tyranny. Well, what is our big philosophical change? What is our big idea? I personally believe that it's the empowerment of the individual because we finally have the technology to truly do that. Um, largely through software that enables truly peer-to-peer -peer economic activity in all areas of our lives. Most of history, most of human economic history, is peer-to-peer -peer economic activity. And we've only lost it in the last 50, 100 years or so. Um, and it's really disconnected us from our money, from how things are made, from who makes them, from who gets the reward from them, etc. And I don't think it's a very good trend. And I see a lot of reason to believe that we're going to be reversing it. Um, if, if you think about it, power is really organized effort. You can have a whole bunch of resources, but if you can't organize them into the same direction, you're not very powerful. If you can organize them to do the same thing, that's actual power. So previously, the only way you can kind of organize power was with central control, governments, NGOs, corporations. But what the blockchain, Bitcoin enabled is the ability for people all around the world to just kind of consensus vote. I'm into this, I'm gonna devote my resources toward it, and yet no one controls it. If there's a fork in the chain, someone decides, I think this is more valuable, and you decide to vote with your, with your mining to go in that direction, you're, that's your voting. You know, this is an actual uh, democratic process that is also massive and new in that way. Um, <clears throat> but we're also seeing the emergence of a number of other kind of quasi-P2P platforms, like ride sharing, couch renting, and I would even argue that web commerce engines like Amazon and media distribution engines like iTunes kind of fall into that same category. They're not decentralized, but they rely almost entirely on a peer-to-peer -peer business model. Airbnb doesn't own the, the houses that it rents out. Uh, Lyft relies entirely on a fleet of unprofessional neighbors driving neighbors. Amazon makes almost none of the products that it sells. YouTube, you know, so on. You, can, you, get, the, you get the idea. Basically, all they really do is they facilitate the discovery process between 
that connects the buyers and the sellers in the whole process. And in some cases, they take a really large chunk in order to do so because central control is expensive. With as big as YouTube is, and as hun is hundreds of millions of videos and, and, and uh, hundreds of millions of, of, of people watching them, five billion dollars of revenue last year from the 50% cut they're taking from their, their content creators, they're still not profitable because the cost of central control is way too high still. So, <clears throat> what YouTube really did was it demonstrated that free is the right target price for digital content and that there is absolutely enormous demand for content that doesn't need to be purchased. And the rise of crowdfunding really proves that people are very much willing to support the artists that they love. <clears throat> but we believe that because of those kind of costly central points of failure, there are much more efficient ways to do it that will ultimately defeat all of these kind of central mechanisms. So that's exactly what we set out to do with our first distributed app. We call it Alexandria, and it is a P2P library of art, history, and culture. Essentially, you can think of it as YouTube or Spotify, but without servers and with built-in payment rates. So it's truly like a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace of content uh, with all the features that, that users should expect from a content app, but with no middlemen, no servers, and no outside control of any sort. Um, so here's how it works, basically. The app relies on API calls that basically just ask a background process that is communicating with the blockchain for its index of content. Um, it communicates two-way, it can submit uh, new content, and it can, it can, it can browse uh, the index for the information. The user can either, um, <coughs> in our kind of dev version, this is kind of light, but right now you can click this and it'll click to local, or switch between local host and dev. And what they're doing is they can either talk to our central hosted server that does have its own blockchain if they choose to um, because they don't want to download a copy of their blockchain, they haven't updated in a little while, whatever else, or if they want it to be a truly peer-to-peer -peer process, they can update, they can download and sync and update their own local copy of the library or of the blockchain um, and switch this to local host and the app works entirely peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, with a really simple, straightforward process, they create a publisher account basically just by uh, attaching a name, and by name I just mean kind of a moniker of sorts, uh, to an address so that they can receive tips. And then with another very simple process, and again you don't see any of this behind the scenes, but with another simple process they, they can submit content of basically any kind just by signing a transaction with that same uh, uh, address. So they can sync, or they can rather publish uh, their 3D printable uh, phone case, their cat videos, their feature film, um, their alt hardcore rap LP, their Bitcoin book, whatever they like. Um, we embed whatever we can. Video can, can stream embedded, audio can stream embedded, PDFs and, and a couple of ebook e formats can all kind of embed in the app. They've all got magnet links so that you can actually download it with a third party app if you just want to keep the content locally. Um, the submission process basically just involves submitting a transaction with metadata that describes what it is so that it's searchable and findable. You know, what is the genre that it's in? What's the name of it? What's your description? All the stuff that you would normally put into YouTube or SoundCloud or whatever else. Um, along with a hash that represents, that basically identifies how you can find it within the BitTorrent mainline DHT. Right now we're using the mainline DHT. We're very excited to work with the IPFS team to use their DHT instead. It's got a lot of additional functionality. It's a lot faster. It's really quite, quite awesome. Um, they can uh, choose to monetize it however they, they, they uh, would like. Uh, they can take optional tips. Right now we also give them the option to do like a pay what you want wall. I'll show you an example of that. Um, where a user is forced to do something, to pay something, um, but it's up to them to decide how much they want to pay. If someone chooses to set a minimum requirement of zero, they could in fact uh, uh, choose to just send nothing and, and they'll get the content anyway. Um, I don't have any Bitcoin on this computer, so I'm not going to show you that. Um, but you can see, obviously, it blocks my ability to see it. Uh, we want to also add other monetization options. We're going to be working with a company called Rivets uh, to do kind of a distributed DRM mechanism um, so that the hardware has access to the keys that enable it to uh, open an encrypted file that's being distributed totally peer-to-peer. -peer. That way, you can still rely on the crowd to distribute your content, but it's locked in a way that no one can have access to it. And only if you, if you use this smart contract system, you send, send a payment, it enables your CPU to have access to it, 
and you actually have the ability to say, well, I don't want this one to do it, I want my phone to do it, or this one, or whatever else. So we can get around all of the really irritating things when it comes to uh, the DRM process with, say, iTunes, for example, it's really quite a hassle if you've got more than five devices or if you want to, you know, turn off one other one because you have to talk to their central server. Because we're designing this so that it's entirely in the, in the, the individual user's hands, it makes it a lot easier. Um, but we're basically open-minded about as many different monetization mechanisms that we can provide in a truly peer-to-peer -peer way where it isn't going to rely on someone <laughs> clicking a button and saying, okay, we'll avoid that and anything else is open to us. Um, also, if anyone that knows anything kind of about BitTorrent knows that your ability to get a file off the BitTorrent network really, really depends on how many uh, peers have access to it, how many people are seeding it right now. And if a particular video, like my cat video here, isn't quite popular enough to have enough users actively watching it right at this moment, that when I come along and want to click it, I'm going to have a good seed rate, I can actually spend, say, a buck or so to get 100 users to see that file for me for a year. So the, the, the publishing cost is almost nil. It's basically just a mining fee to incentivize miners to put that content into it. Right now it's a cent. It's likely going to go up to something around a buck. Um, and then the, the distribution cost, if you need to, if you've got a super popular piece of content that's going to be uh, have enough seeders in and of itself uh, from its own popularity, you're good. If you do need to pay for it, it's going to be something like a buck. Um, so between these two different processes, you've got something that's permanent, that you can't change, that uh, can be distributed to anyone, that no one can, uh, can block because they're relying on, entirely on these kind of two different peer-to-peer -peer technologies. Um, now you as a user can choose a, to del delist your media if you so choose. All this really involves though is it's going to remove it from the browser, the Alexander browser, because obviously, I'm assuming that there aren't too many newbies in here, but the, if you don't know this, the most basic thing about blockchains is that once you put something in it, it isn't going to come back out. So what gets published is published in a very permanent way to nerds and hackers that want to deep dive into the actual blockchain. To the end users, they have the same experience. Where if they choose to delist a piece of media, no one else is going to see it. That's fine and dandy. Um, and <clears throat> yes, we are taking some steps to prevent people from being able to publish feature films that they don't own, other pirate content. Because we see this as something that not just indies and kind of uh, as crypto anarchists are interested in, but something that can actually provide a better, kind of more efficient platform for film studios and for uh, uh, record labels. So we want to, where they've had a very kind of aggressive and anti that attitude toward BitTorrent in the past, we want to show that this is really just an enabling technology where they spend an enormous amount of money to distribute their content and pirates spend nothing and they get better distribution. So why not actually co-opt that kind of technology to, to enable all of us to be able to have more freedom of how we express ourselves. So the things like those, those YouTube videos that kind of blew my mind are more protected. Whether they're honest or not, I want them to be protected. This, I believe in the right to, to freedom of speech and it, that it isn't just an American thing, that this is a human thing and the internet proves that it's possible. So what we set out to do was kind of bake the concept of freedom of speech into the internet itself. So um, I'll try to show you a little bit of a demo here. We don't have uh, port discovery working and the Wi-Fi is kind of blocked off, so some of these aren't really working yet. Um, anyone that wants to see it, if this isn't working, um, come beat me up. Oh, good. Okay, I get it. We don't want you. Just go along with it. because uh, it, it kind of proves that it works better than we kind of thought it would. We expected that you'd need about a dozen decent seeders to be able to stream HD content quickly. Right now, I think there's probably three people that are, that are, that are actually sharing this content right now, and we're getting 720p uh, playback. So with this, you can do flat lossless audio, which I think is a really big deal for the, the, the music industry because they've been unable to deliver lossless quality audio for 20 years since the, the record disappeared. Um, and then obviously 720p or 1080p uh, video. So 
Um, I don't know where we're at on time. Do we have four minutes for, for questions still? We can do one or two questions. One or two yeah. questions, all right. Yeah. Go ahead. So on your website, you're raising money, $6,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What's the, how are you going to do that money? Like, Developing. Um, this is alpha. It still has a kind of a memory leak that's annoying as hell. It's there's, as you saw in the library, there's only five submissions. Only the developers are submitting right now. We don't, we're not ready to kind of open the floodgates yet. We've got a couple dozen alpha users uh, that are anxious to do so. Um, but we want to make sure that a few other things are kind of in place before we do so. So we've got, I mean, actually, if you look at the website, there is a very extensive list of, of the kind of future plans for this. This is, this is the most basic proof of concept working, which is awesome. We are above certain amounts simply because the, the the SEC basically just said that we can now, as of like a couple of weeks ago, uh, when we started the, the crowdfunding campaign, we weren't planning to, but above say, a few thousand, we would absolutely be open to do so, because this isn't a crowd sale of coins, where a lot of uh, companies kind of launched a, a coin pre-sale. The, the coin that we're using is already on the market, it's already getting, getting uh, mined and hashed. We didn't see any value in forking it just so that we can have a, a pre-sale of the coin. Um, and you know, we see there being a lot of value for the community in this, and as we start to kind of show uh, to larger and larger groups, the very first video we put up is way too technical for kind of a, uh, a mainstream uh, crowdfunding audience. We're going to do kind of a more spiffy marketing kind of thing a little bit. Uh, but really what that is, is we're developing this one way or the other. That timeline is if we can raise that money, it enables us to focus entirely on it. If we can't, it might take longer, but we're doing this one way or the other. So. Anyone else? Go ahead. Uh, so you mentioned uh, BitTorrent and Bitcoin as the sort of technologies that are underlying this. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have your own blockchain where all these files are like embedded in the blockchain? Yes. Or yes. Right now we're using our own, well, kind of our own. It's not really our own. Um, there's a blockchain called Florin Coin that lets you put 528 bytes of information in every transaction. Uh, one of our lead devs, when we first started the project, had discovered it really early on and was just jazzy excited about it, doing all kinds of little apps on top of it, like love notes and stuff like that. So the whole time that we've been in development, we've been planning on using that. Recently, some people pointed out that there are some ways in which we could, in fact, use Bitcoin or the Bitcoin blockchain. Many people will tell you that that's the only way you can go because it's got all the hashing power in the world. Um, it would create quite a few sacrifices in the way that the app works. You can't, like, we could put just the hash into the Bitcoin blockchain because you have 80 bytes. Um, and then your data is protected, the media itself is protected, but there's no descriptive information. So we don't have an index to search or browse. Um, so there's other routes we can go, but ultimately, we want the app to work. The specific flavor of technology that drives it, whether it be the BitTorrent uh, mainline DHT or the IPFS DHT, and whether it be the Bitcoin uh, blockchain or MadeSafe or Ethereum or Florincoin, whatever it's going to be, we're going to make that decision for the sake of the best ultimate outcome of the particular uh, of the app itself, not the specifics of the community behind any particular coin. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, oh, last one. Last one? Okay. You mentioned somebody can delist content that stays in the blockchain. Yeah. How does it delist things? Where is that? Just sends a new transaction to the blockchain that says delist uh, and references the old one, and it just, the front end says, okay, keep that out. And we're going to use that same thing for pirated content. If something is obvious to us that it's pirated, we're basically just going to put it into a filter list where anyone that's browsing this on the website won't see it. Anyone that's in their app won't see it by default. They can turn off filters because we're not about enforcing mandatory filters um, and kind of get the full experience, but it's on them. It's their responsibility. Okay, cool. Thank you, Debbie. Cool.